coming up on Aqua Kids. Join the Aqua Kids on their adventure to Sedge Island, New Jersey, as they kayak around the salt marsh, catch their own dinner, and learn firsthand about composting toilets. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. Hey everyone at home. Welcome back to another great episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Katie. And I'm Drew. On today's show, we're headed out to Sedge Island. Sedge Island? I've never heard of that before. Me neither. <laughs> That's because it's a tiny island located in the Barnegat Bay in New Jersey. All right. Well, what are we going to do out there? A bunch of cool stuff. It's a surprise, though. <laughs> let's get out there so you can find out for yourself. Okay, let's go. The Aqua Kids arrived this morning at Island Beach State Park in Seaside Park, New Jersey. At the docks, we were greeted by the amazing staff of the Sedge Island Natural Resource Education Center. After loading up all of our bags onto the pontoon, we took a short trip out to the island where we would be staying the night. If you'll slowly get up and walk toward the front of the boat, I'm slowing down because we're in such shallow water here. I'm going to bring the engine up and get the bow down a little bit. On our way over to the island, Jim made sure to not only point out the thriving wildlife, but also some interesting features of the environment, such as an osprey nest with chicks. Do you guys know what kind of birds those are? An osprey? See if you can see three chicks in the nest as we approach. These birds are used to being close to a boat, so they're not going to fly away probably, but they are protecting their chicks. Notice the bird in the center of the nest has his or her wings out. They're shading right now. Sun's pretty hot, so they're protecting the birds. Baby chicks, I don't know how old they are, but pretty darn young from the sun right now. They're just shading the birds. They're not even getting food right now because these birds aren't that hungry yet. They're still too small to eat a lot. Look down in the water here, it's so clear. We were in three feet of water, it's gonna drop off to 12, and you'll still be able to see the bottom. Sometimes the striped bass will lay right up in here. They're just feeding now with this outgoing tide, so they'll sit here and wait for the bait fish to just drift over their heads. They'll come off the bottom, nab them, go right back down, hang out there. Okay, welcome to Sedge Island. As soon as the boat pulled up to the island, the Aqua Kids jumped off the boat and excitedly awaited an intern-led orientation to the island. Jess pointed out some cool features on the map of the area. From a nuclear power plant to a bridge we crossed on the way over, she gave us a comprehensive overview of the place where we would be spending the night. What a fun boat ride over. I know. I can't wait to see what else Sedge Island has to offer. Well, when we return, we get a chance to explore a bit more. Stay tuned. Aqua Kids presents another Aqua Kids pop quiz. Salt marshes are very important for animals that live on or near the coast. What is the purpose of a salt marsh? Is it A, to provide coastal protection, B, to deliver nutrients to coastal waters, or C, both A and B? Think you know the answer? I'll be back with it after the break. Did you get the answer? The answer is C, both A and B. Salt marshes play a large role in defending the coast from flooding and erosion. Salt marshes also provide habitat for thousands of species. Next on schedule for the Aqua Kids was a trip through one of the most productive ecosystems in the world, the salt marsh. While the ecosystem is not particularly diverse, it is still an extremely important environment for many different plants and animals. So we're gonna take a walk on this salt marsh here, and the grass that we're going through right here is salt marsh grass called Spartina. And this is a very highly nutritious grass, good for a lot of things. It's a little scratchy on your legs, you feel it? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, you can feel that little scratching. Little. And this is called salt marsh cord grass. That's the common name for it. As we're approaching ahead, look ahead, and you'll see there's a straight line going across. Mm -hmm. It's a plant that is able to go on land that's a little bit higher. And can you guess what makes the land higher there? Uh. 
As soon as you get there, you're going to see just on the other side of that is a ditch. So oh. when they dug that ditch back in the day, they piled up the sand and the sand was a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. and that sand allowed this line to go right along here so you can see exactly where that ditch goes. So how important is the salt marsh to the environment? Salt marsh is one of the three most productive environments on earth. Wow. Coral reef, rainforest, salt marsh. Highly productive environment. Provides so many services for the ecosystem here around the bay. It's just incredible. It's a sponge. It soaks up water during storms. It provides incredible habitat for animals like the fiddler crabs, the animals that we've seen here. All kinds of ducks and other animals live out here. It's just a really, really productive kind of environment here. So why is this in a straight line? Well, you tell me. What would make a straight line in a salt marsh like this? Hmm. Maybe if it was man-made? Exactly right. Of course, people dug this ditch. It's called a mosquito ditch because it controls the mosquito population. When you have water coming in like this, it's low tide right now, that's why it's all muddy. But when the tide comes in, the fish come in with the water, they swim up in these ditches, they go into these ponds and eat the mosquito larvae. Oh. It's called a biological control. Rather than spraying chemicals like they used to use DDT, now it's done with biological controls using fish. How do fish control the mosquito population? These are mosquito-eating fish, so when they swim in, in the bay, they eat the mosquito larvae that are coming up in the mud here. These are hatching in these stagnant ponds. The larvae rise to the surface. Mosquitoes can just be eaten by all these little fish. They're called killifish. There's a whole variety of different fish that can live right in this not very salty and not a lot of oxygen water, but they can survive in here, and they eat those mosquitoes. Okay, you guys, I've got a little activity for you. On the count of three, everybody on this line right here is going to jump and you guys are going to be amazed. Ready? <laughs> One, two, three. Her. Whoa. Oh my God. Did you feel that? Not real amazed, <laughs> but now we'll be more amazed. Ready? On the count of three, you guys jump. Get ready okay. to be amazed. <laughs> One, two, three. Jump. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Were we amazed? Absolutely. Sure. So what's going on? Um, I, yeah, I think the ground acts as like a big sponge, so when it's like, you hit on it, it's like, it causes this like ripple effect. You got it, you got it. The, the ground is shaking under our feet because we have this layer of grass, underneath it, thick mass of roots, under that mud, and then water. Hmm. So it's a very fluid surface here. So this entire marsh is not exactly floating, but it's suspended in a way on a layer of water and mud. So this is Clam Reef. Um, there are no restaurants or supermarkets out on Sedge. So naturally, we had to catch our own dinner. So after a quick clamming lesson, we headed out. When you're pulling this rake, pull it right down on the sand. Don't worry about the algae. Get down, the clams are buried a couple inches down, so get it right down in deep. Right here? Right there is a great spot. Just don't get too close together. You don't want to rake over anybody's foot. Instead of doing it with your arms, put it on your shoulder so you can pull down like this. If you rake over it, just reach down with your hand and pick it out. All right, see there, he's handing it out. Good job. There it is. Good work. <laughs> oh, this one's a baby. No, I got one. Oh, this yeah, one's huge. Right hear it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, how'd we do? Guy's got a good bunch of clams there. Now, Jim, I noticed that some of these clams have like a weirdish red-brown color on them. Are they still safe to eat? Good observation, Katie. These are absolutely safe to eat. If you look at these clams here, they are different. This one has a pattern on the shell. That's that reddish-brown that you talked about. And that shows that it's a clam that's grown by a hatchery. These clams actually start out as tiny seed that we buy, and we raise them from tiny clams two millimeters about that size right there, just that little white end right there at the hinge. Wow. This clam is about three years old, and you see that brownish red pattern there, which shows that genetically it's been altered, not in a bad way at all, but just that it was started in a hatchery. Because the natural clam set in this Barnegat Bay right now is one clam in a million lives to be a mature clam this size or slightly larger. Wow. So it's tough odds as a natural clam. We grow these clams in a protected environment and then we put them out in the bay in an organization called Reclam the Bay.
It was very cool to explore the salt marsh. And it was also kind of fun to catch our dinner. I think I caught more clams than you. In your dreams? <laughs> Don't go away. Aqua Kids will be right back. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Let's head back to Sedge Island to see what else Jim has in store for us. All right. One of the famous activities to take part in on Sedge Island is the Sunrise Paddle. The Aqua Kids cast and crew got up at 5 a.m. to catch the sunrise out on the water and tour around the island. But before we hopped into our kayaks, Jim made sure that each of us knew how to paddle efficiently. Okay, or a great day to be paddled on the marsh. We had a nice sunrise this morning. A few clouds, we're out here early. See what's going on. Some birds here. Osprey nest over to your right. You can see the bird sticking its head up. So we're gonna get up in one of these little ditches here. Natural channel in the salt marsh. Okay, that's Spartina grass there is the basis of life in this salt marsh. The mud that's below it, is the detritus living mud actually. It's good stuff. Amazing, it's the basis, the bottom of the food chain. So Jim, tell us a little bit about the diversity of the salt marsh. Well, salt marsh doesn't have a lot of diversity. It's got a lot of life. The biomass in the salt marsh is huge, comparable to a rainforest and a coral reef, but the diversity is way down. It's a lot of salt marsh cordgrass, the Spartina that you saw yesterday, the, all this stuff out here, this low grass, very, very rich, a lot of nutrients in it. And when it rots and breaks down in the winter, it forms the detritus, that thick brown, black mud that we saw yesterday. That's the basis of life in the salt marsh. So how does this affect the uh, environment of the world? Salt marshes are extremely important places. We didn't realize that until about 30 years ago. We used to use them as garbage dumps, like the Hackensack Meadowlands, where New York City dumped most of its trash. Right now, we realize how important they are. In Superstorm Sandy, for example, salt marshes serve as a giant sponge to suck up some of the water instead of being overrun into people's yards, over bulkheads, ripping out docks, and doing things like that. The habitat for animals is incredible. It's got a whole variety of things, starting at the lowest invertebrates in the mud, building right up to some of these top species that we see, top of the food chain, like the osprey, like the peregrine falcon. How is this specific salt marsh impacted by Sandy? Well, the salt marsh, as you can see, is very, very healthy. But what happened is all the built environment, the people's homes, docks, everything else, washed away, and it actually swept across this salt marsh. Oh, wow. The marsh where we are right now is under about four and a half, five feet of water. So it came up really, really high. So the salt marsh was underwater, and not much happened to it specifically. But there goes a peregrine falcon, that bird that you hear right out there, it's flying to the right, it's at about two o'clock. That's oh, the wow. top predator species, and we're really lucky to be able to see it flying away from us. Everybody get a look at it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's not a big bird, but it's right up there. That's the one that lives in that little white house up there. The first peregrine falcon hacking tower that was built to bring back this endangered species. Now, Jim, what is the importance of showing people an environment like the salt marsh? Well, I'm an educator, so for me, it's all about teaching people about this area. But the importance, if you understand the basic principles of ecology, you look at stuff that's at the bottom of the food chain, and we have to keep that healthy. And the salt marsh is a healthy place. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of Barnegat Bay doesn't have salt marsh anymore. It used to have it all over the place. But now it doesn't have so much because people have built their homes right up to the edge of the water. Everybody loves a water view. And to do that, they filled in the salt marsh. So people, instead of having salt marsh cord grass, like the Spartina, now have grass. And that's not good because to get grass to grow in sand, you have to put a lot of fertilizer on it. Fertilizer gets in the water, creates algae. That's the stuff that we saw yesterday, that slimy green stuff. So you have this, all these problems. And it's basically because people don't have an understanding of that. They're living in this environment and they have to understand that they have to live with it. You can't beat it. The people that live on the barrier island that Superstorm Sandy took out a lot of their houses, some of them just think that, oh, I could just rebuild again and that won't happen again because it's once in 100 years. I don't believe that. I think we're going to have more and more frequent storms and it's going to create more problems. Salt marshes like this will help a lot to 
mitigate the, res the danger, the damage from that because they will suck up a lot of that water. If you have a bulkhead, the water just goes over it. If you have a lawn, it floods out. If it's your house and your garage and everything else, you got your car lost, your house lost, everything. So a lot of my friends and neighbors just lost a tremendous amount during that storm. Well, Jim, thank you so much for taking us out this morning. Although it was a little early, it really is an important place to Ah, it's about. a pleasure. It's <laughs> great to get you guys up. You were up real early. You were quiet in the house. That was wonderful. You're a super group. I'd love to have you come back and spend some more time with us. We had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Do you have any final thoughts for us? Yeah, the thought I would be that you guys are the ambassadors. You're putting this on TV. A whole lot of people are seeing this so that they get the idea that they can maybe not come out in kayaks like you are, but get this kind of an experience sort of vicariously through your experience here. And if everybody gets the idea that these salt marshes are important, then the world will be a better place, in my mind at least. Absolutely. Thanks for coming out with us today. Thank you for having us. Katie, how much fun was this? I had so much fun today. I'm glad you had a good time, but did you learn a lot? I learned so much. Good, It's really good. interesting awesome. to see all the wildlife out on the salt mine. Yeah, that's it. The wildlife, the plants, it's a very, very important place in this whole ecosystem. We Thanks for going with us today. <laughs> Thanks for having us. While it was an early start, our tour around the salt marsh was very informational and a lot of fun. It was really cool to learn that the salt marsh doesn't have a lot of diversity, but that it is still extremely productive. That's right. Don't go away. Aqua Kids will be right back. Aqua Kids salutes aqua heroes, people working hard to keep the planet green and blue. Dr. Louise Wooten heads a study on invasive vegetative plant species in the sand dunes of New Jersey, along with the Georgian Court University. The dunes often go unnoticed, but they are absolutely essential to the area. For example, during hurricanes and storms, the dunes significantly help to buffer flooding. The health of the dunes can be the difference between a mild or detrimental impact on the land, which is why Dr. Wooten's research is so important. Dr. Wooten uses a GPS to map an invasive dune species called Asiatic sand sedge. By keeping track of invasive, threatening plants, preventing their growth and encouraging the development of native sand dune plants, she helps to rebuild the dunes and keep all the occupants of the area safer. Here's our top story. Adventurer finishes a 101 day kayak trek. Sunrise kayaks on Sedge Island are fun. But can you imagine waking up and sunrise kayaking for 101 days straight? Well, that is just what adventurer Sarah Outen did. After being the first woman to successfully row across the North Pacific Ocean in 2013, Sarah's adventure continued as she took an 101 day kayak trip along the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. Although the journey was not always easy, Sarah was thrilled to have finished the adventure. She tweeted, super, super chuffed to make it to Homer today after an amazing kayak adventure with my good pal Justine these last 101 days. I'm Katie with Aqua News, keeping you connected to our planet. Now back to Aqua Kids. As our time at Sedge was nearing a close, we wanted to make sure to mention one very unique thing about the island. The bathroom. So Jim, during our stay here at Sedge Island, I noticed that we took a lot of measures to conserve natural resources. Can you tell me about those? Boy, you better be able to tell me about those. All <laughs> the things you had to do while you're here, what are some of the things? Yeah, let's see. We didn't take showers. We right. turned the water off while we were brushing our teeth. Excellent. When we were washing dishes, we used a bucket instead of running the water and washing good, them that good, way. Good. And one of the very interesting ones was the toilet. Or should yes. I say the Clivus? The Clivus Multrum composting toilet. Yep, that's where we're going now. All right, well, what exactly is a Clivus Multrum? Well, you'll see it looks like an outhouse, but it's very different because instead of like an outhouse where the waste goes down into the ground, everything is compost in a pit below. We hmm. put a biocide in there and it actually breaks the waste down. So here it is. I noticed the door is closed. That's a little unusual. We try to keep that open most of the time. Hmm. So would you like to look inside? Yeah. Oh, guys, give me some privacy. I'm trying oh my gosh. short. Oh, oh, my gosh. That was absolutely horrific. Sorry. Oh, brother. Well, anyway, now that it's so the open clivus. and empty, the clivus, as you can see and smell, and it doesn't smell because it has a solar-powered vent fan that takes all the gases out. All the waste is composted in the pit below. 
It's clean, it doesn't smell, it's not your basic outhouse. This is a highly sophisticated waste disposal device. Nothing gets into the water, nothing gets into the land. All the waste is composted right here. So do you ever have to remove the waste? Very rarely. It breaks down through natural processes, so rarely do we have to do any work on pumping it out. It's not like we have to have the sewer man come and pump out the waste. It just breaks down. It's great. That's fantastic, and it's great for the environment as well. Absolutely. Very sophisticated system. It comes from Sweden. Jeez, guys. I just wanted a little privacy. Well, maybe you should lock the door next time, Drew. Next time. <laughs> but we're out of time for today's show. I sure had a great time at Sedge Island, though. Me too. Not only did we get to explore the salt marsh on foot and by boat, but we also got to catch our own dinner. It was cool to be in a place that was so dedicated to conserving resources as well. Jim and his interns at Sedge always made sure to remind us that everyone can do their part to help keep this planet green and blue. And so can you. So visit our website to follow us on our journey. And learn how you can come along with us, so together we can keep the world and the water a great place to play and explore. And we'll see you next time on, on Aquafids. Aquafids. Traveling